Hi everybody! I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about patent ductus arteriosus. So let's get into it. So a quick little anatomy review. If you recall, the ductus arteriosus, it's a good thing, it's a normal thing that occurs in fetal circulation. So before the baby is born, the pressure in their lungs, because their lungs are full of fluid as a fetus, right, is super high. Super high pressure, super high resistance. So that the blood doesn't really want to go to the lungs because the pressure is too high. So it needs to go somewhere else. So it takes a little shortcut or what we call a shunt. And we have three shunts, one of which is the ductus arteriosus. So this is a normal thing that happens in everybody's body as a fetus. And then labor and delivery happens, the baby is born, right? What happens? <gasps> they take those first breath, the lungs fill up with oxygen, that water comes out, that fluid comes out, and the lungs, which were super high resistance, now become low resistance, so low pressure. And what does blood like to do? It likes to go to areas of low pressure. So in normal, healthy deliveries, the baby takes their first breath, which decreases the pulmonary pressure, then the blood starts going to the lungs instead of away from the lungs like it did as a fetus. The blood goes to the lungs and away from the ductus arteriosus, and normally this is enough to cause the ductus arteriosus to close. So what we're talking about in this video is when it doesn't close, okay? So patent, it stays open. And a cute little thing you can remember, so our PDA, but you can do it backwards, ADP. So the blood flow goes from the aorta to the ductus arteriosus to the pulmonary artery. So some signs and symptoms of a patient who has a PDA. So that ductus arteriosus did not close normally like it would, like it's supposed to. It's gonna vary with the size of the defect. So if it's really small, the patient could be completely asymptomatic and totally unaware that this is even happening to their body. You as the nurse or the doctor might not even detect it because there would be no reason to, right? If it's a large defect, the baby is going to show signs of like heart failure. The first thing you will do as the nurse when you're doing your assessment is you're gonna hear a heart murmur. And I say you're gonna with a grain of salt. Hearing a heart murmur is difficult and takes practice. So a lot of times when I'm in clinical and if I have students and I say, hey, come listen to this baby's heart, do you hear the heart murmur? Half of them will say yes, and then half of them will say, I have no idea what I just heard. I can't hear anything. That's okay. Do not get discouraged if you're not like super good at getting murmurs right away. It takes time and practice. And even the best nurse and the best doctor sometimes we'll miss a murmur because sometimes they're very, very hard to detect. And then sometimes they are super obvious. When you're doing the assessment and you're listening for that murmur, the best place to find it, left subclavicular margin. That's the best place to find it if you're looking for a murmur. So other symptoms the baby might have would be fatigue, feeding poorly, um, widening pulse pressures. So these are things you would check like in the hospital when they're brand new. PDA is one of those things where if it's small, you might never know they have it and they could have it well into adulthood and not be aware that they even have it, okay? Or if it's large, it causes all these complications and problems. So it's going to be very individual depending on how big the defect is. So let's say they go home. You didn't hear a murmur, they weren't feeding poorly, any of that stuff. What are you gonna notice like during checkups and things? Baby's not eating well, baby gets frequent colds, they're not growing, they're not you know, going up on the growth scale, they're staying in like below that 10%. And if they do blood pressures on an infant, which isn't super normal in the clinic, but let's say they felt like they needed to, they would note a widened pulse pressure. So these are things you would see on babies who have, you know, they didn't check it at the hospital, it didn't get detected, but now we're checking it, you know, at the clinic, at their well baby checks, things like that. 
With a lot of these heart defects, if we didn't know about it prenatally, they didn't see anything funky on the ultrasound, baby's born, they're not having any symptoms, how would we know? One thing that is becoming more and more common is the CCHD test. So basically before discharge, all babies, even ones with or without risk factors, will get this done. And it's just kind of a standard thing. All it is is a pulse ox. That's all it is. So you put a pulse ox on baby's hand, you put the other pulse ox on baby's foot, and then you check the O2 saturation of their upper body and their lower body, and then you can compare those. Now this isn't diagnostic, it's not definitive, saying like, okay, if they're below 95% or they're within 3% of each other, then yes, this baby absolutely has some sort of heart condition. It's not like that, but it can lead us to looking into other things to check this baby's heart if they're not having any other signs and symptoms to look at. So this is a simple test that we can do and that we do do routinely on newborns to check and see if they have any heart conditions, heart defects, and then we can do further testing after that. So now let's talk about how is the PDA diagnosed? How is this diagnosed? Most of the time they go off of signs and symptoms or if they're asymptomatic, they'll do that, you know, CCHD heart screening, the pulse ox thing we just talked about. And if that's abnormal, they'll usually order an echo. So they'll get an echocardiogram, and this is kind of what doctor uses to diagnose this. They might also get a chest x-ray. A lot of times when they're doing that, it's not necessarily to like, oh yeah, for sure it's the PDA. They'll be looking for that, but they're also going to be looking for other abnormal like heart conditions as well, because you can have more than one. The baby can be born with multiple congenital defects, not just this one. So the echo will confirm this along with signs and symptoms, but then they might also do an x-ray to see if there's anything else going on. So who's at risk? Our biggest population at risk are our premature babies, our preemies, okay? So babies born before 37 weeks are more likely to have this than babies who are born at term. People who have a family history of heart problems or have other genetic conditions, I gave Down syndrome here as an example. A lot of times babies who are born with Down syndrome, which is a wide spectrum, they can have various heart conditions. They can have various, you know, cardiac complications, and the PDA might be one of them. Rubella infection in pregnancy. So rubella is one of our torch infections, if you remember. It can cause a lot of damage to the baby's blood vessels and the blood vessels of the heart, right? So if mom gets infected with rubella during pregnancy, this could cause the PDA. Being born at a high altitude, I think that one's kind of interesting. So I think it's like 4,000 feet. A baby that's born at an altitude of higher than that is more likely to have a PDA. And then being born female. So females are twice as likely to have a PDA than males. Treatment is going to be very factor dependent. So how old is the baby? Is it a preterm baby? Is it a term baby? Are they symptomatic? Is the defect large? Is it small? That kind of stuff. So a couple of options include waiting, waiting and doing nothing and monitoring and making sure they're okay. So this is something that they will frequently do if the baby is premature or if the baby is term but has no other signs or symptoms. It doesn't appear to be bothering them because some people it just takes a little bit longer to close. It could take up to one year to close. So just waiting and it'll close on its own. Other options include medications. So for premature babies, NSAIDs might be a drug they choose. This would not work on a term baby or an adult who happens to have a PDA. In that case, they're going to use something called indomethacin. Okay, so this is another like big popular med in the OB neonate world. So that's what that's for. And if they're not going to do meds, they might actually decide, you know, this is more serious than that. It's not closing. We've tried other things. We're going to do surgery. So a surgical closure might be a, something they want to do. Again, benefits outweigh risk in this procedure. We have to be very careful when we do any sort of surgery on a baby this age. Last thing I want to talk about are preventative things and complications that can occur. 
When talking about complications, it's important to know these usually only occur when the defect is large and it goes untreated. So, those include pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, and endocarditis. Is there anything we can do to prevent it? Kind of. <laughs> we can't technically prevent it. It can happen to anybody, but we can prevent some of the risk factors. So the biggest risk factor is premature birth. So doing things to prevent premature birth can help prevent a PDA. So those things include early prenatal care, quit smoking if you're a smoker or drinking or using drugs, substances, things like that, quit all that stuff, bad habits. Eat healthy and exercise. Avoid infections. Because remember we talked about rubella, right? Especially getting rubella during your pregnancy can cause this. So avoid infections. Update your vaccines before pregnancy. So specifically, you cannot get the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella, during your pregnancy. So if you can get that updated prior to becoming pregnant, if you're like planning to become pregnant, and then you gotta wait a couple of months before it's safe for you to get pregnant after you get the MMR. But let's say you've done that, you are less likely to get a rubella infection, you are less likely to have a premature birth, and therefore your baby is less likely to have a PDA. And the other one is control diabetes. So this is all diabetes, type one, type two, and gestational. If your diabetes is out of control, or if you don't have it under good control, you are more likely to go into preterm labor and your baby is more likely to be born with a PDA because of the prematurity. So not really anything we can do to necessarily prevent this, specifically related to this, but if we can prevent things like infections and premature birth, we could possibly prevent PDAs from happening. So that was my video on patent ductus arteriosus. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.